evening, but I want to begin with a reading before we come to the series, and that's in Isaiah chapter 40, which is basically going to be the title of this series. So we're going to begin as that reading from Isaiah 40, verse 1. Isaiah 40, verse 1. <clears throat> Well-known passage. I think I've shared this, I'm sure I've shared this. This is the passage the Lord called me to preach. Uh, well, he certainly kicked me out into the uh, highways and byways to proclaim the gospel. I didn't see myself as a preacher until the Lord spoke to me from verse 9. But let's read this word. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sin. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid, say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Amen. Let's just pray. Lord, we ask now that you would help us as we begin this series to do that very thing, to behold your God, even now, for your great name's sake we ask it. Amen. So I want to begin a series particularly based on that statement at the end of Isaiah 40, verse 9, Behold your God. It's a series on the attributes of God. Now I'm well aware today that people don't even believe there is a God. They don't. And there are people uh, that are not even interested uh, even in God at all. Is there a God? Does he really matter to them? I personally think most people are not atheists, although many claim to be. I think the, if you talk to them, they're more agnostic than atheists. Uh, it's not so much that there is no God, it's more that you can't really know God. It's not a knowledge of God. You, can, you can't really know there is a God. You can't be certain there is a God. That's where I think most people are at. Now, of course, to them, the existence of God, therefore, is an utter irrelevance. It has no meaning. It has no purpose in their lives, no relevance to them whatsoever. Well, the Bible answers both of these groups in any case. It says to the first group, the atheist, do you remember it? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And to the second, it says God can be known. There is a God and he can be known. Jesus said in John 17, this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, and of course, Jesus Christ whom you sent. God is to be known. That's the point. Not to be believed that there is a God, but to be known. You know, I believed that there was a God for 23 years. It didn't do me any good. It didn't do me any harm, but it didn't do me any good. It didn't help me in terms of salvation. You've got to know God, not just believe there is a God. God is to be known. And that's the essence of that statement. Behold your God. You're to see God and you to enter into a knowledge, an intimate, deep relationship with God. And God can only be known by us as far as he reveals himself to us. And we know that God has revealed himself, for example, in creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. Paul says his invisible attributes in Romans 1 are clearly seen. And then, of course, we see from the Bible. 
the, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. God is revealed supremely in this book. But even that isn't enough. There's a hymn that some people don't like, but he's bang on. Beyond the sacred page we seek the Lord. In other words, the Bible is to bring us to God. It's not an end in itself. So you're to come to church and hear a sermon, yes. You're to come to be taught the Bible, yes. But I keep on saying it, but you are to know God. You're to meet with God. God is to reveal himself to you. And that's the bit that you should be praying for. So if you want to know what God is like, you've got to pray for this. You've got to know uh, the Bible. You've got to turn to the Bible. That's what we do on a Sunday. That's what you should do every day. Ultimately, many have gone before us further than we have attained. They've, they've taken this book seriously. They've read it. They've prayed over it. They've sought God and they've found him. Do you remember in Jeremiah it says, if you seek me, if you search for me, with all your heart, I will be found by you, says the Lord. I remember the Lord revealed that to me as for a Christian primarily, not just an unbeliever. See, we can know God in a way that we've never known him. And that's the point of the Bible. If you read the great confessions of faith, which are written down in the history of the church, the Westminster Confession, all these great confessions of faith. Do you remember the catechism question? of that Westminster Confession. What is the chief end of man? First question. Man's chief end, chief purpose, is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. But I wonder if you've ever read question four. Let me read you question four. What is God? What a question that is. What is God? The answer, God is a spirit. Infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. In his being, in his wisdom, his power, his holiness, his justice, his goodness and truth. And they go on to say, this is our God, the greatest of all beings. And so what you have there is a declaration of what the Bible reveals about God. So that's where we're going. So let's begin. My text is in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 27. Now... I'm not going to give a background to this. We will read a portion of this prayer. But let me just read you a section of the prayer. Verse 27. Solomon is praying in the temple. And this is what he prayed. But will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, how much less this temple which I have built. So my message tonight, we begin the series on beholding God with the infinite God. The infinite God. Here is a prayer by Solomon, and if you've listened to that verse and you're looking at it now with me, you'll see he, he's just built the temple. We'll see it now, we'll read a bit of the prayer, and he prays these words. I've just built this, and yet he says, God, will God dwell on earth with men? Uh, you know, behold, the heavens, the heavens of the heavens, are, 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 they cannot contain you, much less this temple that I have built, this puny little place that I have built for you to dwell in. As he dedicates it, he prays that prayer. Let me read it from verse 27. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, and he spread out his hands towards heaven. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there's no God in heaven above or on earth below like you who keep your covenant and your mercy with your servants who walk before you with all their hearts. You have kept what you have promised, your servant David, my father. You have both spoken with your mouth and fulfilled it with your hand as it is this day. Therefore, Lord God of Israel, now keep what you promised your servant David, my father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man sit before me on the throne of Israel. Only if your sons take heed to their way, that they walk before me as you have walked before me. And now I pray, O God of Israel, let your word come true, which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. But then there's this but, but will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, heaven and the heavens of the heavens cannot contain you, how much less this temple which I have built. Yet regard the prayer of your servant 
and his supplication, O Lord my God, listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying before you today. That your eyes may be open, verse 29, towards this temple, night and day, towards this place which you have said, my name shall be there. That you may hear the prayer which your servant makes towards this place. Listen to verse 30. And may, you, and may you hear the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel. When they pray towards this place. Here in heaven, your dwelling place. When you hear, forgive. Now it's a marvellous prayer, isn't it? But can you see what... He's declaring in verse 27. He pauses in the middle of that prayer and says, wait a minute, what am I saying? I've built you a temple. (laughs) And yet God, he reminds himself, doesn't dwell on earth. Indeed, he says, the heavens and the heavens of the heavens, they cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I've built. See what he's saying? He's saying ultimately that God is an infinite God. That's what he's saying. Infinite. What do we mean? It means God has no limit. You can't put a limit on God. Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. God, he's saying, is of such immensity, such sheer infinite immensity, that the, there is nothing that you could measure alongside him. He's such a being, get hold of it tonight, that even the universe is too small to contain him. It's mind-boggling, this verse. That's what it means, infinite. He's not limited by space and by time. He's not limited by power. He's not limited by knowledge. There is absolutely no limit with God at all, none at all. So we're looking at space uh, and God is not limited by it. He is infinite. God says Solomon is bigger than the universe. The universe is a puny thing compared to God. That's a statement and all. How big is the universe? You know how big it is? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. We just don't know. Scientists have puzzled over this question even in recent years, but for centuries. Some have asked the question recently, is the universe infinite? Is it an infinite universe? Because they just built bigger and bigger telescopes and find it vaster than they ever imagined. They thought it was. People knew it was big years back, but now it just seems to grow. And they said, maybe our universe go further than that. Is just one of many infinite universes. People are saying that. Well, take, for example, our galaxy. We know it as the Milky Way. It's called the Milky Way. What is it, this galaxy? How big is it? It's 100,000 light years across. It's been measured, and that's the size of it. it. It's got 400 billion stars in it. This is our galaxy that you and I exist in. Our nearest galaxy, the next one to it, is called the Andromeda Galaxy. And that's 220,000 light years wide. It's a bit bigger than this one. And even more billions of stars. So how big is the universe? Well, we're looking at two galaxies. And there is an infinite number of them. No one can possibly know the size of it. All we know is what we can see. And according to the measurements that people have seen, so far it's 93 billion light years big. I'll say it again, 93 billion light years big. Billions and billions, trillions of stars. You just can't conceive in your mind How vast, how mind-bogglingly big is the universe. You can't get your head around it. It truly is beyond our understanding and comprehension. And yet, here in the Bible, it amazing. Do you remember in Genesis it says, and he made the stars also just as an aside? And here Solomon says an incredible thing. Even the universe, the heavens, and the heavens of the heavens, they cannot contain you. 
It's, it, God is bigger than this immense, vast universe. The Bible says he is present everywhere. We'll see that in this series, in this universe. Let me give you some verses. Now, we want to look at the Bible then tonight. I want to turn to Isaiah again, but Isaiah 66 this time. And I've got a number of verses to look at. Isaiah 66 and verse 1, it says this. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What a picture that is. Heaven, the universe is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where's the house that you'll build for me? <laughs> Even God's saying it. No, not the Solomon. Where is the place of my rest, of my dwelling? Let me give you another. Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah 23 and verse 23. And verse 24, I am a God, I'm sorry, am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide himself in the secret places so that I shall not see him, says the Lord? Look at the end of it. Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? What a statement that is. Do you remember Stephen in the Acts of the Apostles before he was martyred? Remember in his sermon, he, he, if you want to understand the Old Testament, I've always said read Acts 7 and listen to Stephen's sermon. He gives you a kind of potted history of the Bible, a potted history of the Old Testament. And it comes to a kind of point where he talks about the tabernacle. And in verse 34 of his sermon, he says, Our fathers have the tabernacle in the wilderness. We'll be looking at that on Sunday morning. In the wilderness, as he appointed, instructed Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen which our fathers, having received it in turn, brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favour before God, asking to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob, but Solomon built him a house. So now we've got a, not a mobile tabernacle, but a physical one, a permanent one. Look at what he says in verse 48. You see, Stephen knows his Bible history. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet said, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. Isaiah 66, you see. What is the house that you will build for me, says the Lord? What is the place of my rest? You see, he's got a, a thorough biblical understanding of the sheer immensity of God. God does not dwell in temples. It says it again and again in the Bible, made by hands. No, no. Even the universe, this vast universe, cannot contain God. So when we speak about God being infinite, we've got to understand what the Bible is saying. It's a, it's a vast truth in itself. It's beyond our comprehension. But we've got to try and grasp a little it's not the same as, for example, saying God is, and we'll look at this, God is omnipresent. God is everywhere present. God being everywhere at the same time. It's not that. It means God, I say it again, has no limits. There's no limit to his being, his person. You cannot measure God. You can't put a tape measure on him. You can't say how big is God. You can't limit him in his being and his actions. He's infinite, he's limitless, he's endless in his person. It's impossible to get your head around this. It's, God is a being that you cannot measure. It is impossible to measure him. You know, in mathematics, we use symbols, don't we, like pi, which means an impossible number, an infinite number, because we can't work it out. Well, ultimately, God is impossible to measure. He's infinite. Because God is infinite, that means he's said to be what we call transcendent. He's, the, he's what Isaiah says in Isaiah 57, the high and the lofty one who inhabits eternity beyond our wildest imagination. He exceeds the, the limits that we think of, the usual limits, the measurements, even the vastness of our universe. God far exceeds that. They are but fractions of an inch compared to the immensity of God. We're talking billions and billions of light years. And God says they're not even comprehensible measurements in the measurement of God. He's bigger than that. He transcends it. He surpasses it. 
He's far beyond human limit. He's greater than the universe that he created. The whole purpose of this vast universe was to bring him glory. To show you, to give you a glimpse. When I see the stars, when I see the heavens, David saw it. And it's giving you a glimpse of a God who is vastly powerful. He's above everything. He's independent of everything. He's infinitely above it all. He's the high and the lofty one. And look at another way to see it, the way the Bible presents it, is to look at man and compare him to God. What are we? We're the opposite of God. He's infinite, we're finite. You see, we're limited. You and I are limited. God is unlimited. He's not limited. Do you remember Job? Job has a great statement on this. And Job had to learn a lot about God, didn't he, in his experience. In Job 11 and verse 7, can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? Can you see that? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens. And then the question comes about, what can you do? What can you do? What can you know? Isn't that what God says to Job at the end in chapter 40? What do you know, Job? Tell me, you instruct me. Do you understand who I am? Do you understand how big I am? How immense I am? How many times the Bible says this, and particularly in Isaiah 40? Can you search the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? They're higher than the universe. They're vaster than anything you could imagine. Oh, you can't ultimately define God. Only what's revealed in Scripture. God is an infinite mystery. A boundless, endless being of mystery. There is a mystical element with God. People don't like that. They, 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 they say, no, let's stay with Scripture. That's enough. Mysticism, it frightens them. Listen, it's nonsense. Yes, thank God for the Bible. We cannot know anything about God from this book. But God, even with the Bible, is an infinite mystery. There's a vastness that we can never comprehend and grasp. The very idea that if you've studied the Bible, you've somehow got God and you've sorted it all out. You've done your theological degree and you, you think you know something. You know you're like these foolish people who come out of education and think they know everything. And actually after a few years when they get older, don't we learn? We know nothing. You could write what we know on the back of a postage stamp. God is an endless, endless ocean. He, he, is, he is infinite. We rely on things for our existence. We're finite, you see. God relies on nothing. He's infinite. He needs no one. He needs nothing. You remember what he said to Moses? I am that I am. The self-existent God. God is, one best way to describe him, he is unfathomable. That's a good description of God. So much you can really not grasp about God. So much we don't know about God. Scientists talk about there's so much we don't know about the universe. We, we as Christians should realize there's so much we don't know about God. And if we had an infinite eternity to get to know him, we'd still be learning about him. He's an infinite being. We, we know so very little about him, only what he has revealed to us. We say God is eternal. What do we mean? We look at that. Well, it means he's not limited by time. We say God is unchangeable. He's immutable. He's not limited by change. He doesn't change. We change, he changes not. Now we say tonight he's infinite. He's not finite. He's not limited at all. Can you see it? Not at all. Not by anything. He's boundless. He's beyond measurement. Time and space can be measured. God cannot be measured. He stands apart from all of it. From space and time. He's infinite. There's no limit to God. The, 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 the God that Solomon is praying to here, he says... He doesn't just feel the universe. It's too small to contain him. 
He not only fills every part of it, but he is beyond it and totally separate from it. Can you see? He's high above it. What does it mean? He, he transcends. He transcends beyond the universe. Time and space are measurements that don't come into the equation. God is infinite. Now we've repeated it, we've said it, and we've looked at it. But what do we do with it? What's our response to it? There's got to be a response if we believe this stuff, if we say this is what we believe about God. If we can pray like Solomon, that this is our God and this is what he's like. Well, let's begin tonight by reminding ourselves this is not some sort of academic study. We're not here to just learn about God. We're not here just to learn and grow in the knowledge of God. It's important to do that, but that's not why we're here. We said at the beginning we're here to know God. You're meant to know God, experience him. Man was created to know God. The chief end of man was to know God, to enjoy God, to glorify God. So when we examine these attributes in this study, it was to be, the purpose of it, the aim of it, is to bring us a greater knowledge and experience of God. So as you come along on a Sunday, you pray, Lord, I want to know you, not know about you. See the difference? And I want to experience you. Do you know God? What is your experience of God? We become non-mystical today, non-experimental, totally cerebral. We have a, a knowledge about God. A knowledge about God? Is that it? Is that all? Are you satisfied just to know there is a God who's infinite? Are you satisfied to know there is a God that the Bible says is so great? No, oh, this, this is eternal life. This is Christianity that you might know him. The only true God. Knowing there is a deep knowledge, an intimate acquaintance to the experience of God. Do you desire to know God? You want to know him. Tozer wrote a great book, The Pursuit of God. You know, he, he said, the moment you become a Christian, then you begin your journey to pursue God. Your life's purpose is to pursue God, to know him, to experience him. I suggest, if we read 1 Kings in chapter 8, and verse 27, and Solomon says, look, he says, what am I doing here? The universe can't contain you. And if we agree with him, there's got to be a response, hasn't there? There's got to be some kind of a response. We've just got to stop and think for a moment what he's saying. Pay attention to the words. Again, I remind you, we've got to think about this heavens, this heavens of heavens, this universe that Solomon's referring to. And he didn't have the, the, the knowledge that we have today. What are we talking about? We're talking about trillions of light years. Our sun, 93 million miles away. And yet, according to the people that measure these things, there are suns that are so large, they could put literally millions of suns, our suns, inside them. They are so vast. You can't even try and imagine something that big, that vast, that immense. And yet, again, we're told it's still too small to contain God, to even begin to fit him in. God is bigger than that. God is bigger than that. God, when you begin to meditate upon him, should overwhelm you. You know, it should blow your mind, as we say. Your brain is going to pop now. It's going to be like, I can't take anymore. That's the way you come to God. That's the way you say, oh Lord, such knowledge. It's too much. I can't take it. It's too wonderful. It's not a negative thing. I'm not saying, oh, don't give us any more of this. It's too heavy. No, no, quite the opposite. It's overwhelming me. It's, it's completely overwhelming. Do you know what's wrong with us today? We're not doing that. We're not overwhelmed by God. Have you been overwhelmed by God recently? Has he literally thrown you to the floor? Has he, has he literally, as you've had a glimpse of him, thought, oh, this is just too much? Have you had that experience? Have you ever had a, a revelation of God and God has spoke to you? Whatever it is, I'm not going into experiences. 
uh, yours is different than mine, mine's different than yours, but it's been so overwhelming that you thought you, were, you just couldn't cope with the, the knowledge of it. You fell maybe to the ground, you couldn't stop weeping, and you just went, oh, oh, God, you are so infinitely incredible. That cannot be really true, but it is true, and you know it's true. Listen to what Isaiah says in our reading. And this is the way, it's not Isaiah, of course, it's God speaking directly through the prophet Isaiah. Look what God says. He, well, he, he tells the prophet what he's got to do. He's got to get up, he's got to proclaim it with a loud voice. He's got to say to the people these three words, Behold your God. Get them to see God. Behold your God. That's what people need to see today. Just God. Lift up your voice. Don't be afraid. Say to the people of, of 2023 in Britain, Behold your God. Look at him. Look who he is. And then God himself jumps in. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hands? Who's measured the heavens with a span? The heavens, the universe now. The calculated the dust of the earth. Weighed the mountains, the hills in a balance. It's mind-boggling, isn't it? Listen, to whom will you liken me, says God? Come on, who are you going to compare me with? To what would you liken me? To whom would you liken or compare with me? Who could be my equal? How do you conceive of me? How do you think of me? And that question that keeps coming back, God keeps asking you that question. How will you think of God? How will you liken God? What do you compare him with? Who is his equal? Lift up your eyes, look around you and say, I not only made all this, it's all too small for me even to dwell in. Can you see the picture we're given? There's got to be a response. There has to be a response. And I thank God in the Bible I find a response. I find it everywhere in the Bible. I see it again and again. I see men responding. I see, I see people falling down on their faces before God. Let me give you one. 2 Kings chapter 19. 2 Kings chapter 19, listen to this, Hezekiah, verse, uh, 2 Kings 19 and verse 15, look at what he says. Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O oh Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. You see, before he prays, he's going to ask God now. He's had some bad news. He brings it to the Lord in prayer. But how's he going to begin? How's he going to pray? He's going to remind himself of this infinite God he's coming to pray to. How great he is. He's not just going to say, hey Lord, I've got a problem here. I, I need you to help. The church has got a problem. We're in difficulty. Lord, please hear our prayer. Oh, please pray for this. Pray for that. No, no. Let's stop and think. Oh, God of heaven. He's calling upon the Lord. You who dwell in eternity, who inhabits eternity. You alone have made this earth, heaven and earth. Acts 4, the great prayer. It's exactly the same. They lifted up their voice to God and said, Lord, you are God. You are the infinite God. You are the vast, incredible God. Listen to another one, 1 Chronicles 29 and verse 11. Oh, David blessed the Lord before all the assembly, and he said this, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel. Can you see how we praise? Look at how we praise our Father forever and ever. Yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom. You, you are exalted above everything. He's praying to somebody called God. A real God. A God who's way bigger than the God of Christianity today. He's vast. He's infinite. This is the, the Bible. It's to teach us, to remind us, this is the way we should pray. Oh, look at the way the psalmist prays. Look at the way he comes before the Lord. Look at the way he calls upon the Lord. Do you remember Psalm 8? Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. 
You remember how it begins? You've set your glory above the universe, above the heavens. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, and that's all that he can see. He hasn't even conceived of, of the vastness of the universe. Only what his naked eye can see. The moon and the stars which you've ordained. Look at this. What is man that you're mindful of him? You're so infinitely big. The heavens can't contain you. For what I can see. What is man that you're even thinking of us? Again, another psalm. Psalm 145. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above the earth. Can you see the picture? See what they're after? Psalm 95, oh come, let us worship, let us bow down, let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, a God who is infinite. Oh, what does it tell us about faith tonight? What is it teaching us, this Bible about faith? It's teaching us what God says everywhere in this book. Not only do you understand who I am, but do you understand my abilities? My infinite ability. Behold, I am God. I am the Lord of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? This is the way he speaks to us. With God, with an infinite God, obviously nothing is is too hard for him. Nothing is impossible. Where's our faith today? Have we not got, have we not got ourselves into a position where God has become a little bit too small in our generation? Our view of God has become too small. What should we do? We should get a bigger view of God. Starting tonight, an infinite God. Get a bigger view of God. Is your view of God growing daily, weekly, monthly, yearly? So as you go on in your Christian life, God is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger in your eyes. And obviously you are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So you can say like David, what what are you even thinking about me? I'm nothing. How are you even conceiving me? You can't get your head around, of course. The more you know, the more, the less you know. This endless ocean that is God. What are you going to make of the gospel? Let's think of the gospel for a moment. What about the incarnation? What are you going to do with that? How are you going to get your head around the incarnation this Christmas? How are you going to think about it every time you think about the coming of Christ? This is the way Wesley thinks about it. Let me me read you what he says. I quote this many times. See the eternal Son of God, a mortal Son of Man, dwelling in an earthly clod which heaven cannot contain. Can you see it? Can you see him in the manger, he's saying? Can you see God in human form? This God in the heavens cannot contain. Look at this. See the Lord of earth and sky, humble to the dust he is. And in a manger he lies. Stand amazed at this. Stand amazed at it. Amazed at the incarnation. Our God constructed to a span, incomprehensibly made man. The one whom the heavens cannot contain is now in a human body. It's it's beyond description. What about the cross? How does this apply to the cross? We looked at it this morning. Well, can you see what it means now, the cross? Let me put it this way. It means an infinite sacrifice. Sacrifice without measure. Remember we said he had an endless priesthood, no end to it, unlimited. An infinite God who gave an infinite sacrifice. You can't measure the sacrifice of Christ. You see the gospel? If God is infinite, then his love is infinite. His love, we sing, is as great as his power, nor as measure nor end. His mercy is infinite. You can't measure it. His grace is infinite. We've just sung about all the deep, deep love of Jesus. Vast, unmeasured, boundless and free. You can't measure it. It's infinite. How much does he love me? With an infinite love. You can't put a measure on it. It has no end. It's endless. How much does God love me? What a question that is. Look at the cross. 
An infinite, boundless, without limit, without measure love seen at Calvary. If you want to know God, this is why he made you. This is why we have the Bible. This is the point of it all, that you might know the only true God. That you might believe and you might come to know him. You know, there's nothing greater than knowing God. There's nothing greater in your life, nothing. Nothing you're going to do tomorrow that's going to ever compare with knowing God. Nothing. Nothing greater than enjoying God. Nothing greater than experiencing God. What is even more incredible about God, I think, the best part of him is this, is when he reveals to you how much he knows you. How much he knows you. The infinite knowledge he has about you. You know him, yes. You love him, yes. But you only love him because he first loved you. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. But they know me. I know them, they know me. But you see, I know them. Jumps off the page. I give them eternal life. They follow me. Why? Because I know them. And I have loved them with an infinite love. This is what he came into the world for. There can only be one God. We've said it this morning and we say it again. There can only be one God. Why? Because there's only one infinite. He can't have two infinites. Do you know him? You know you can know him ne never, never, ever will you fully comprehend him. But you can know him. You can apprehend him. But you can never comprehend him. You can lay hold of him. You can seek him and you're, you're encouraged to do so. And you will, you, he, I will be found by you, says the Lord. And yet, he's an endless ocean. We're seeking, ever seeking, ever laying hold of him. And I do believe it's put wonderfully by William Faber. Listen to this, I'll close with this. My God, we're going to sing it to close this service. How wonderful thou art. Listen to these words. How wonderful thou art, thy majesty, how bright, how beautiful thy mercy seat in depths of burning light. How dread are thine eternal years, O everlasting Lord, by prostrate spirit day and night incessantly adored. How wonderful, how beautiful the sight of thee must be, thine endless wisdom, boundless power, and awful purity. You see the infinite God he loves? Oh, how I fear thee, living God, with deepest, tenderest fears. And worship thee with trembling hope and penitential tears. And then I love this. Change in the hymn. He says, yet I, like David, whatever man that you're mindful of him, yet I may love thee too, O Lord. Almighty, O infinite as thou art. For thou hast stooped to ask of me the love of my poor, tiny little small heart. No earthly father loves like thee. No mother e'er so mild. Bears and forbears as thou hast done with me, thy sinful child. Father of Jesus, love's reward, what rapture will it be? Prostrate before thy throne to lie. And ever, how about this, ever gaze on thee. Do you know what heaven is? It's infinite. Infinite. There's no measure to it. How long will we be there? Infinitely forever. You cannot measure what an incredible God he is. Let's come and let's call upon him together. Let's pray. Lord, please hear our prayers tonight. Help us, Lord. Forgive us how little we know of you. May we make it our aim in life to know you, the only true God, to know you deeper, to experience you. We've got to have the doctrine. We've got to have the teaching. But we've also got to have the experience. And then we've got to have the response to that. We've got to follow you. Oh, help us, oh Lord, to be people who know their God. For your glory, we ask it. Amen. We're going to sing to close that wonderful hymn by William Faber. My God, he says, how wonderful thou art. Let's close the service with that hymn.
Thank you.